Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 674 of the podcast and it is Saturday the 11th of February 2023 as I record this from, you can probably tell from the audio, I am in uh, a hotel room, I'm at the Antlers Hotel in Colorado Springs where I've been speaking at the Superstars Writing Convention and more on that in my personal update but yes the audio is not so great in this intro but it improves for the interview which I recorded a few weeks back. So in today's show, I'm talking to Honoré Corder about why you need a book marketing mindset, tips for marketing your backlist, tapping into your ambition and more. Now, I love talking to Honoré as she has a brilliant business mind and she has a real positive spin on things as well. So that's coming up in the interview section. So in publishing and book marketing news, well, draft to digital have just added a new library partner founded by the Digital Public Library of America. Palace Marketplace is the only not-for-profit ebook marketplace for libraries, making it easier for libraries to quickly build their collections of high-quality indie ebooks. Over 400 libraries and library systems across the US have already signed on with more to come. So if you publish through draft to digital, then just log in and you can opt all your books in. I did that. <laughs> I actually went in to set up my pre-orders for Pilgrimage on the main stores and I opted all my books in. And of course, if you want to sell more books through libraries, make sure your books are in library catalogues so they can be ordered. Then tell your readers and audiobook listeners they can get your books for free in the library. Just speak to the librarian to get the book ordered. And yes, you can get my books in ebook, print or audio. Just ask your librarian. So also an interesting article from veteran publishing commentator Mike Shatskin this week. It's uh, titled, Running a Publishing House is Not as Fun as It Used to Be. (laughs) And he says, The book publishing business in which I have spent my working life since the early 1960s is disappearing. And it's always interesting to hear from Mike. uh, And also at this conference I am at Superstars, you know, many people have been in this for decades. And hearing the sort of longer term perspective is always fascinating. Now, Mike's article addresses and links in the show notes as ever mike addresses the fact that the acquisition of simon and schuster was blocked for penguin random house which means that probably the sort of um aggregation of all these big houses won't be able to continue in general so they won't be able to acquire in order to grow they'll have to grow organically but he says it looks like general trade book publishers of scale can't grow organically anymore and he says two things impact this they have lost control of where books come from and basically books are not just coming from publishing houses now Uh, he says publishing by entities that are not primarily commercially driven that means some you know a lot of self-published authors are not commercially driven to entities that live in some other world but can use books to their benefit so that's all the bloggers and youtubers and magazines and all the different businesses that now publish things and books that Uh, he says are responsible for the vast majority of what is a million new titles a year hitting the marketplace. He also said, on top of that, the old books don't die anymore thanks to print on demand. So back in 1990, you would be competing with maybe half a million other possible titles. Today, he says, the number of competing titles is at least 20 million. Yeah, I mean, we all know that. Uh, There are lots of books out there. (laughs) We we all have to acquire our own audience. He also says the second big change is how the customers for books find and acquire them. Back in 1990, books were overwhelmingly in bookstores and mass merchant retail locations. Now, fewer than 30% of physical books are purchased in retail locations. They're mostly transacted online. So yeah, I mean, he's he's writing from 
the perspective of big publishing. But for us, it's kind of that opposite thing. Now, we're still competing against lots of other titles, but finding your own community is always the way forward. And maybe, maybe these days it's easier for an individual to build a community. And we are absolutely um, uh, benefited by the fact that over what over 70% of physical books are bought online. And as you know, with my Shopify store, <laughs> say it together, creativepenbooks.com, uh, I'm now selling lots of print books online and obviously have been with other print on demand for years. But um, yeah, selling direct is, is becoming a bigger thing for print. So lots of interesting things there. Now, it's also important, and again, listening to people at this conference, I feel that many new authors still think the book publishing business is how it was back in the 90s and people are like oh I want a career like Lee Child or Stephen King or whatever Um, but it's very likely that's not possible anymore so that's why you need to think about other ways and that's why it's always great to listen at these conferences many of the authors who started publishing back in the 80s and 90s are also now they still do books with big publishing houses but they're also indie Um, so yeah very interesting And in futurist stuff this week, the biggest story was the launch of the new Bing. (laughs) And of course, we've all been laughing at this and going, it is so weird to have Microsoft suddenly come out ahead with such an incredible launch. And they did a really good job. Um, From an article on The Verge, Microsoft says it's using conversational AI to create a new way to browse the web. Users will be able to chat to Bing like ChatGPT, asking questions and receiving answers in natural language. And I've talked a lot about ChatGPT. Um, which is uh, run by OpenAI, and that's what Microsoft have invested in. So essentially, we're now getting generative search or generative AI next to search. Now, it, it is on a wait list at the moment. I have signed up for the wait list. I, ca- I can hardly believe it since I went sort of Mac only back uh, when I left my day job in 2011. I moved into the Mac ecosystem and I've been using a Google browser, but what's um, Chrome. But it's really interesting because now I've signed up for Bing and getting the app on my phone. And uh, what happened after the day after Microsoft's uh, presentation was that Google launched their AI-powered system, BARD, but the launch did not go very well at all. So while Microsoft is rolling out the functionality to all its products, they basically, uh, another article in The Verge says, Microsoft is gearing up to expand to its core productivity apps, Word, PowerPoint and Outlook. So if you are someone who has been actively resisting AI, you will soon be using these tools even in the most basic word processing and office based tools that you use. And certainly if you're using Teams as part of your day job or MS Word as an author, then probably within three to six months this will all be incorporated. So yeah, who would have thought Microsoft would be the upstart? shaking up the industry and this year is definitely going to be huge in terms of generative AI as ever my recommendation is to take a curious and playful attitude give things a try and keep an open mind now if you want to hear me talk more about the future of publishing I'm doing an online talk on the 22nd of February so I guess that's next week as this goes out on these topics. Now I'm doing this for the independent publishers of New England. Uh, It's online, obviously. And the talk is aimed at independent publishers and rights holders, but it's definitely relevant for indie authors with a business mindset, and they have opened it up beyond their membership. So it is $45 and you can register at thecreativepen.com forward slash future 23. I'll put a link in the show notes, but that's on the future of publishing. And what's so funny is I do have some slides already prepared for this, but now I'm going to have to change things because of everything that's happened, even in the last week, which is kind of crazy. Now, in my personal update. So uh, my Kickstarter finished, thanks to everyone who backed Pilgrimage. And the campaign hit 25,777. One seven hundred and seventy one pounds, which is around thirty one thousand US dollars from six hundred and ninety two backers. Thank, thank you so much. I'm blown away, seriously blown away by how well it went. I actually only had a goal of one thousand pounds. <laughs> I really didn't think that so many people would be interested. Um, so thank you so much for supporting the Kickstarter. And there's actually quite a lot of talk at this conference about how Kickstarter is almost like an advance for a book. 
book, um, although of course the work of the book is done already. But there is absolutely no way any publisher would have ever paid me 25 grand for a pilgrimage midlife memoir. <laughs> I mean, it's just really funny. And I haven't even started selling it on other platforms yet. Plus, it's a pretty evergreen book, so you never know, it may end up being a bigger seller than some of my other books. We also hit the second stretch goal in the last few hours of the campaign, so I'll be doing a live Zoom Q&A uh, on that, and I'm also writing what is turning into a short book on tips for writing memoir both of which are for backers only. So if you back to the Kickstarter, I will announce those this week. I need to record my notes in audio and you can probably tell from my voice it's a little strained. So email me if you don't hear about that in the next few weeks as sometimes Kickstarter emails go astray. I will also do a lessons learned on this show once all the fulfillment is done. So that's probably in late March or April. So one interesting thing that I've noticed is once the Kickstarter was finished, I just had this crazy feeling of an open loop. So I just desperately want to fulfill everything as fast as possible. And I almost feel like I can't do anything else until everyone has got what they paid for. So I sent out the ebooks, audiobooks, digital bundles, PDF workbooks, everything I could, even before the payments were processed, which is you're not really meant to do. But I was just like, I just want to deliver things. And uh, I, I think it's because usually when we... When I sell a book, the reader gets the book immediately if it's digital, and I don't have to necessarily have anything to do with the transaction. Um, but here, people have given me money in advance, and I want them to get the book ASAP. It's like finishing energy that I want to tick off on my list. So P Pilgrimage is up on ebook stores for pre-order for the 1st of May, and it will also be on my store, and I'll be selling all the formats direct and most elsewhere. I love this model of selling direct twice first, so Kickstarter, then I'll have a month on Shopify before I put everything on the retail stores. So this, this really is the creator economy in action. So as this goes out, I will be landing at Heathrow after speaking in Colorado Springs for the Superstars of Writing conference, but I'm still here as I record this. Superstars has this lovely, supportive community full of people who come back year after year in real friendship groups, and they all support each other. And the vibe is just really lovely and very supportive. And I did a half-day craft workshop on writing setting and sense of place, which is um, which I'll turn into a course. Uh, some of people on Kickstarter got that, but I'll also sell it on Teachable when it's done. I also did a session on the creator economy and I was also on an AI panel. And yeah, there were some juicy questions and I've also met up with lots of vendors, caught up with author friends, met some new people, had a fangirl moment with Jonathan Mabry, who is probably my favourite fiction author. I love his Joe Ledger series, Rotten Ruin series, Pine Deep and V Wars and his short stories. I really have read most of his books and I got my selfie moment with him. And so that was very nice. And of course, the benefits of author conferences go far beyond the notes that you might write in the panels and teaching sessions. We are still humans and humans need relationships. And we also remember people and help people we meet in real life. So if you go to a conference, make a goal to meet someone specific, ask for a tip, get a selfie with your favourite author, arrange to meet up with people beforehand. Also, another tip is to pick a conference, a genre conference or a specific indie conference and go every year so that even if you're shy, you do eventually meet people and can support each other. And it, it actually coming here has made me want to get back to Thriller Fest, which has always been my kind of genre conference that I feel most at home at. Um, in terms of being here in Colorado, you can probably hear in my voice, um, I have been talking quite a lot for sure, but equally it's it's the humidity is something like zero or just above zero. It is super, super dry. So I'm constantly hydrating, um, you know, trying to put stuff up my nose, in my eye drops, uh, moisturizing my skin. Um, I didn't expect that. It's very, very weird. I also just have not beaten the jet lag. Um, even though I've been here more than a week, I had a few days in Washington, D.C., a city that's been on my list for a while and um, had really good few days there. Did some book research. I went to the Lincoln Memorial, which I liked, the Library of Congress, 
The Basilica of the National Shrine was probably the most surprising addition and just really beautiful. And there are photos on my Instagram and Facebook at JF Penn Author. But yes, um, it's been worth a trip for sure. But in terms of my health, I don't think it's particularly helped. <laughs> but hopefully once I get away from how dry this is, my body will recover. But yeah, it's like being desiccated in real life. <laughs> So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments. Christina Branham said, thank you so much for the conversation uh, on the chalk tours. For me, it's timely. My protagonist is going to journey through ancient North American earthwork sites. And being part discovery writer, I'm not sure, not sure who they will meet along the way. The podcast gave me some insight that will be helpful. And Henbane left a comment, thank you, I'd never heard of chalk tours. Like I said, same thing for me. Uh, And Henbane says, I've been wondering what Native Americans are up to, as you don't see them represented in anything apart from Westerns and Pocahontas. Uh, Also, they said, I stumbled across Native American rap a few years ago, and there's a TV show, Reservation Dogs, which I haven't watched, but uh, a few tips there. So yes, I think it's really good for us to have, you know, cultures we didn't even know existed and I love finding out about new groups of people or new cultures that I didn't know about before so that's cool and then thank you to Alistair Parker Art on Twitter who said I've started on my memoir in earnest what better place to put pen to paper than with a coffee and my muse Rosie and sent a lovely picture from a coffee shop with his dog Rosie and she looks like a Scotty which my granddad had which was uh, lovely so remember, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen, send me pictures of where you're listening, email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com, or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by Drafter Digital, and I'll play a word from Kevin in a minute. I very happily use Drafter Digital for my distribution to library retailers, including the new Palace Marketplace. I also use Drafter Digital for Nook. And even recently with my short story with the demon's eye, I also use it for Apple because I couldn't be bothered with their interface. <laughs> and also for payment splitting for the relaxed author with Mark Leslie Lefebvre, who is here at Superstars. So it's been lovely catching up with Mark. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. And I've met a few of you here at the conference and just absolutely lovely to meet patrons and uh, especially supporting the extra in between zones. I do have some more on AI coming. Thank you to everyone who supported the show for years and months. You're amazing. And thanks to new patrons this week, Neela von Horsten. Ken Guidros, Anna Maria Anderson, Jolene Dubois, Laura Kunigalite, or Kunigalite, sorry Laura, <laughs> probably massacred that, Tammy Tyree, and Jared Nelson. And if you support the show on Patreon, you'll get the extra monthly Q&A, which is for patrons only, and I'll be recording that in the next uh, week or so after this goes out, where I answer questions about writing craft, publishing, book marketing, making a living, speaking at events, all that kind of thing. You also get uh, extra discount codes, early access and more. You can support the show with just a few dollars or pounds or euros or whatever. And uh, so it's less than a coffee a month or a couple of coffees if you're feeling generous. You can support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, here's a word from draft to digital and then we'll get on with the interview. Hi, this is Kevin Tomlinson with draft to digital Let's talk great couples. Rachel and Ross, Buffy and Angel, Lois and Clark. Don't you just love it when two of your favorites get together? We do. And that's why we were so excited when draft to digital and Smashwords came together like two kids in a TV rom-com. We just had so much in common. Both companies were built by authors for authors. Both offer authors a way to format and publish their books worldwide for free. And both are dedicated to helping all your author dreams come true. Could be the greatest love story of all time. And I'm talking about us and you here. Come see what the new draft to digital is cooking up for you. Find more at ddd.tips slash creative pen. That's pen with two N's. Honoré Corda is the author of over 50 books with more than 4.5 million sold worldwide. She's also a strategic book coach, professional speaker, and host of the Empire Builders Mastermind. 
Her latest book is You Must Market Your Book. Increase your impact, sell more books, and make more money. So welcome back to the show, Honoré. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you again. Now, you were last on the show in 2015, which is kind of crazy. So yeah. tell us a bit about you and how you got into writing and publishing. I was a business coach and an executive coach and corporate trainer motivational speaker. And of course, everyone would always say, you must write a book. Where's your book? I want to buy your book. And I met Mark Victor Hansen, who everyone would probably know is the co-creator of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. And he said, hi, I'm Mark. And I introduced myself and he's like, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm a coach and a speaker. And he could not have been less impressed. He was like, yeah, okay. Everybody's a coach and a speaker. You must write a book. And I thought, Okay. And I just started asking him questions, Joanna, because he seemed friendly. And I Mm. didn't realize in that moment, I was probably asking him the same 52 questions everyone asked him, right? (laughs) That we get asked all the time. But he was very kind and gracious and answered my questions. And I immediately went home from that conference and sat in a chair for three days and wrote the first horrible, ugly draft of my very first book. And that's really how I got started. I made every mistake that we caution against in our books for writers, but I got the fever. (laughs) I was Mm -hmm. like, oh, this is great. I love this. I loved having a book. I loved being able to make a difference and connect with people in ways that I hadn't been able to do without a book. And then I started learning the lessons of how to professionally publish a book and to publish a book well and market a book well and sell books and market with my book. And that was really the beginning of my journey. And that was over 18 years ago now. There's a few things I want to come up there. First of all, he said, okay, you need a book, right? You need a book to be a speaker. Now, I are we living in different times in that everyone does now have a book? And if that's true, if more speakers now have books, or it's much, much easier to publish now, obviously, than it was back then, if everyone can have a book or does, how do we stand? Obviously, we're going to talk about how to market your book. But is that true anymore for speakers and coaches, I guess? I do think it's true for speakers and coaches and entrepreneurs and anyone who wants to differentiate themselves in whatever their discipline or work is. Definitely. I think the next question you were probably going to ask is then how do we differentiate our book from other people? Especially for nonfiction. It's like you mentioned being a business coach, let's say how to communicate better with people or something. A lot of people do keynotes around communication. How does someone in that kind of niche differentiate themselves? Well, I'm going to just take a little segue and say it has to be professionally published. You've got to do an excellent job, whether you indie publish it, you have it hybrid published, or you try to go the traditional route. You have to make sure that your book is, that your book game is tight, right? That your book checks all the boxes of a professionally published book. In addition to that, then the contents of one's book, in my opinion, must be, uh, a window into how they work and their methodology and their processes. The book is meant to start a relationship between the reader and the author. And so the message of the book, I think, must be what it is that you do different as a business coach, as an executive coach, as a speaker, as an entrepreneur. What is your special secret? What is your secret sauce? And putting that in the book and include anything that would give someone a clue as to how you work, why you work, where you work, who you work with, whether you have a sense of humor or not, right? All of Mm. the ways that people can develop a relationship with you in your words so that when they get to the end of the book, the next question they have is, who is this Joanna person and where is she so I can give her more of my money? How can I connect with her in a more meaningful, deeper way? Yeah, as you say, it's if you want people to do business with you, your book has to (laughs) kind of reflect who you are with a business. But the other question I have for you as a professional speaker before we get into the new book is it feels like the highest paid professional speakers are traditionally published. Now, that just may be a coincidence, (laughs) but it feels like perhaps the speaker circuit does 
reward that kind of thing more and what do you think about do speaking venues and conferences and things do they care really how a book is published do you think that's true that people do get paid more when they're traditionally published or what are your thoughts on getting paid as a speaker with an indie book well I have a decent sized keynote and I am indie published I don't think that they care as long as your book is well done you send them a book that is clearly hastily self-published, they're probably going to overlook you. I think there is probably a decent amount of other consideration. Have you built and sold a company or have you held a position at a company that we would know, right? Were you an executive at Apple or Amazon or Microsoft or another company that's easily recognizable? And also, I think some of those folks become speakers and then get an agent and go the traditional route. I have spoken to some of them. Many of them are not pleased with the results of the book royalties. They like the Mm -hmm. fact that their speaking fee is high. However, they would have liked to have had a line of sight to the quality of the book, the production schedule of the book, the contents of the book. And their ability to do what I talk about when publishing, which is the optimization piece and the monetization piece. And just very quickly, optimization is beginning the author-reader relationship, the front matter. And then monetization is the back matter, the opportunity for the author-reader relationship to deepen, right? To say, well, how else can I hire you? And so when you are traditionally published, generally speaking, The front matter and the back matter is geared toward creating the publisher-reader relationship, not the author-reader relationship. And the back matter doesn't allow the author to say, here is what else I do, i.e., I'm a keynote speaker. Here's how you hire me. I know some very well-compensated self-published authors who make $25,000, $35,000, $50,000 per keynote, and they are 100% indie. Yeah, I think the point is that you can choose your route and it doesn't matter. You can make it work in whatever way you want. So let's get into your latest book, which is You Must Market a Book. Now, hopefully anyone listening to this show (laughs) already knows that you have to do that. But you talk about the importance of the book marketing mindset, which I feel is sometimes missed out as, you know, people jump straight into strategies and tactics. So what is this mindset and why is it so important? I believe that the marketing mindset is understanding that for a book to be successful, and that is in whatever way the author defines success and or to hit their vision, is they have to understand that they are going to have to share about their book. They're going to have to market their book. They're going to have to talk about it. They're going to have to share about it. They're going to have to email about it. They're going to have to talk one-on-one. They're going to have to talk one-to-many in order for the book to hit critical mass. And without the expectation that, yes, I'm going to have to market my book. And this is sometimes the difference between the indie published author and the traditionally published author in that some authors think, well, the publisher is going to handle all of that for me. My work is done. Whew, thank goodness that's over, right? And they don't realize that the day their book is published is really the day that the work begins. Yeah. And I feel like you say that it's mostly traditionally published authors, but I still think a lot of indies think, oh, well, marketing is just publishing the book on Amazon because that does (laughs) marketing, right? (laughs) So, right. I mean, yeah, that's it. it. (laughs) (laughs) So we have to disconnect publishing, as in making the book available, with marketing. Right. We have to disconnect the day that the book is published. I believe that marketing begins when you start to craft your book, when you put together the elements of the book, the cover, the contents of the book, the the book bonuses. How are you connecting with the reader? How are you getting them extra value for reading your book in exchange for their email address so that you can create that conversation? I think marketing is baked into the publishing piece, but it is not the end. The, The book launch day does not then complete the publish now button on Amazon does not now complete the marketing portion of our program. That is when you really have to come downshift into fourth gear and punch it, right? You have to have a clear marketing action plan and you have to plan on doing something every day or almost every day to get the word out about your book. And 
my the folks in my master mind get a kick out of my saying, which is that a book is not an avocado. It doesn't go bad. You don't have a finite amount of time to sell your book, especially if it has evergreen material in it. If it's going to be good today, it can sell better 10 years from today, as long as you continually market it. And I feel like part of this mindset shift is, you know, when I'm writing my book, I'm the person in on this side of the equation. But when I'm marketing my book, I have to think about the people on the other side and what they will get out of it. And I feel like a lot of nonfiction writers do this better than fiction, <laughs> for sure. Uh, but for example, I get pictures for this podcast all the time, which just say, I've just published this book, XXX, um, can I come on your show? <laughs> and it's, and I imagine that like newspaper reporters get this type of thing too, which is, I've just published a book, put me in your newspaper that kind of marketing, but that doesn't show any understanding of the person on the other side. So what would you say to that? I would say that when I sent you an email and said, I've written the book, you must market your book. I know you have a lot of authors who listen to your podcast who would probably be interested in my perspective on how to effectively market and sell their books. And if that's interesting, I would love to talk more about that. I I did exactly what I think you're getting at, which is I am thinking about the person who's listening to our conversation, not about me or my book or about even you or your podcast. It's who's on the other, who's the end user, who's the end listener, and how will it benefit them? Because by taking care of that one thing, by making sure that the listener will benefit, then it takes care of everything else. It takes care of you and your podcast. It takes care of me and my book. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think that's really important. And we have to think about the reader. I mean, it sounds obvious when we say it out loud, but you have to think about the reader. And it is hard to switch your head from the creator to the marketer. But how do you do this? Because you're a creator as well. You write, you create lots of things, and you also do the marketing side and the business side. Do you schedule your time differently for honoré the writer and honoré the businesswoman? Oh, sure. Yes. I have my creative time when I have on my stretchy pants and I have on my <laughs> my work marketing time when I am treating my business like a business, even though I am in a room in my home. It's creative headquarters at O Dark 30 and it's business headquarters from morning until late afternoon. And I, what I do in terms of thinking about the end reader is I ask four questions when I am crafting a book. The first question I ask, and this is what I'm asking authors too, is what's in it for you? Let's get that out of the way. What do you really want? Don't be humble or self-serving. Like, I want to change the world. It's like, no, you want a bigger bank account. You want new shoes. You want to, you know, you want to go to a book conference, right? Whatever. And so just state that, get really clear on what the outcome is for you. And then I ask three more questions. What do I want the reader to do? So for you must market your book, I want readers to market their books effectively. The next question is, what do I want them to not do? I want them to not market their book ineffectively or fail to market their books. And then ultimately, I want the end reader to feel empowered to market their books in ways that fit their personality, the role of the book, and their time availability and their budget. And so I wrote it from all of those perspectives. And then I do a review of the content of each of my books, including this one, from each of those perspectives. That's a really good tip, actually. I like that. And I mean, again, that's harder for fiction authors. But for fiction authors, it might be, I want the reader to go on an action adventure thriller and to have a, you know, to have a really good emotional experience in a romance or it can be the emotional promise of a fiction book and the transformation of a non-fiction for example correct yep that's right yeah no I, I really like that now it's interesting you did mention that you want people who read this particular book to find the marketing that fits their personality and it, there are so many marketing options there are paid there's free there's content marketing there's in person there's online there's so many variations on themes but an overarching question is how do you know <laughs> what might work for your personality and your book and how do you not get overwhelmed Well, so I broke it down into the four things I mentioned 
just a second ago. And I did that on purpose because I wanted people to start to listen with their ears open, right? Like, oh, this could be different. This could be helpful to me. I'm an introvert and I don't like walking into a room of people that I don't know. I can do it. I used to teach people how to do it. So I know how to do it. That doesn't mean that I love it or that I want to do it on purpose. Um, So I recognize that book marketing can include doing all sorts of things that are contrary to my personality, which means I will, like being on a diet, not eat carbs and exercise for exactly four hours. I'm miserable. It's the longest four hours of my life, and I can't wait to to have a sandwich, (laughs) right? (laughs) And so I think when people look at book marketing, the first thing that they're doing is looking at what other people are doing, and they just think, well, I have to do that. In fact, I hear people say, well, Colleen Hoover, I'm sure you know who Colleen Hoover oh, is. I'm everyone sure does now. <laughs> who Colleen Hoover is. But the first thing they did was go, okay, she became famous because she used book talk. So now I have to do book talk. And I've had several people say, Honore, you have to do TikTok. You have to do book talk. And I say, I don't. It seems like a wonderful idea. I would love to spend hours mastering a dance and producing a video. Oh, wait, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> I I would, that would be awful. I would have a good time because I can laugh at myself. I would, I can't dance. I, it would be terrible. It would be the worst video. I don't want to learn video editing, right? I mean, it's just, there's, it has hashtag disaster written all over it. So when you uh, and by the way, I'm not, I don't do TikTok either, but we should say that people are doing other things other than dancing with TikTok, but it's an example right. of don't do what you don't want to do. <laughs> yes. And that's what I was about to say is that when you give yourself permission to say, here are the things that I really like to do. I love being a guest on a podcast. I love having a meaningful conversation with a host that adds value to someone who gets to listen to it later. That's really fun for me. It's not hard. I like it. I could do it all the time. Some people, I have done books with authors who don't have a following, don't want to do podcasts. So we look for strategies and tactics that work great for them and their personality, and also then the role of the book in their business. So when you have a nonfiction book, the book has a role in your business, and it's important to understand what the role of the book is so that you can get connected to the activities that will connect the book to the readers. Mm -hmm. And that can be broken down into all sorts of different things. One of them is geography. If you're selling services in one zip code, then you don't really care about Amazon, right? You don't care about an Amazon launch or being available in all countries, whether you're wide or or local, you're going to print copies of that book and you're going to give it out to market your business. So geography is one of the factors. So you start to stack, okay, my personality is I'm an extrovert. I love people and I'm not limited in my geography. Then I'm probably going to publish wide. I'm probably going to publish in all the different ways, audio, hardcover, paperback, ebook, right? Hmm. And then I'm going to publish it everywhere it can possibly be published. And then I'm going to do, you know, everything I can possibly do. When you're looking at paid versus free, I always look at not how much money I have to spend, but I always start with how much money do I have to spend and how much money do I have to earn in order to have that money to spend? Because you and I both know if you make $10, 50% of it's gone. Mm -hmm. So I don't make $10, I make $5. And so if I spend $5, then I have no dollars. If I spend $5, then I want to return on that investment. So some people will look at it and go, it's only a hundred bucks. It's only 10,000 bucks, right? (laughs) Whatever it is. (laughs) And they don't think about, well, if you spent $10,000, you really probably had to earn $16,000, $17,000, $20,000, right? They're not thinking about the after-tax, after-expenses aspect of it. I think about it from the perspective of what's the heavy lift that it does? Does it get me in front of people that I can benefit? And does it bring readers to the book that allows the book to fulfill its job? Yeah, so there's a lot in there. Yeah, I like that. I like you mentioned geography, actually, because you made me think there because I have always focused on global sales. Like I don't have my books in I don't even approach bookshops, even here locally in the UK. It's just not something I've ever thought about because 
all the marketing I do is global. And part of choosing podcasting, for example, was this is global. This 228 countries, uh, people have downloaded this show, including Antarctica. (laughs) And it's kind of crazy that we can reach all these countries around the world with some marketing, or we could do a local fair and reach a couple of hundred people in our local area. But that's still valid too. And that suits different people, different business plans, I guess, different business ideas in general. Yes. Yes. And you also don't, if you were not working globally, if you were working locally and you had a book that when you gave it to someone or sold someone that it was a five figure or six figure income for your business, you wouldn't worry about geography. You would just want the book to get into the right hands. And what's the fastest path to making that happen? So I I also wanted to ask you, because you and I have been doing this a long time now, <laughs> and yes. you mentioned like 18 years there. I think I was 2006, I started writing. So yeah, I mean, we're similar kind of yes. timeline for us both. Now, what has changed? Like, What does not work anymore that you hear people saying, oh, you must do this, and actually it's not true? And what still works and what remains evergreen? Well, I think what's what's changed for the better is that we have more publishing options. So I think when you and I started in the aughts, right, in the mm. 2000s, there there weren't a lot of options. I think Amazon did the Kindle, and then I saw Smashwords a few years later, I think. Other way around, then- other way around, um, originally, they, they, a similar time. But I mean, the point being, like, there was no digital publishing that early. There was no print on demand. There was no digital no. audio. <laughs> Yeah. No, 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 no. I had my first 15,000 books printed and shipped to me. It was not print on demand. I had to buy 5,000 books at a time in order to get a favorable price. So it really is so favorable now. So we have more publishing options. We more, have more acceptance of independent publishing and we have more opportunities based on that. I think what doesn't work is haste. Uh, being solely promotional and not adding value to people. I think that doesn't work and it's never worked. I don't know that there is a strategy that I could across the board say it doesn't work, Joanna, because there's going to be somebody that's going to raise their hand and go, well, that kind of worked for me <laughs> right? <laughs> or several someone's. So I don't ever want to say, well, that never works. But I do know that if you are a transactional person versus a relational person, you're going to have to work harder. You're going to have to have more times at bat to get the same results as someone who's just a relationship person and who cares about their readers and is trying to add value. Mm. And on that, I think one of the things that has stayed the same is email marketing. Like that was a thing originally, and it still is, right? Yes. And it is the only thing you own. I saw a, a content creator today. I got an email and they said, I'm no longer doing this. I'm going all in on this one platform. And I was like, you don't own that platform. What are you doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> Unless you own the platform, going all in on something and giving up the one thing that you do own, right? Or the things that you do own, your website, any uh, platform that you pay for, like Slack or Circle or something like that, where you have to pay. So they can't close the doors or decide to close their doors to you at any given time. And of course, email. I think email is the thing that has stayed standard, even as other similar tactics have been tried, right? You think of email as being not only on your desktop, but also on your phone. Well, texting is on your phone, but I don't like to get a lot of marketing texts, whereas I don't mind marketing emails. Yeah, I know what you mean. And if you can stay in someone's inbox for years, and I know there's some listeners to this show who've been on my email list since like 2008, <laughs> which yeah. is kind of crazy. Like if you can stay in someone's inbox that long, you've got a relationship. So when you talked about relationships, you didn't necessarily mean it, it doesn't have to be one-to-one. Like you can have a relationship with people through this podcast, for example. When I meet people, they're like, oh, and they know all about me. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you know, in yes. an email, you can do the same thing with email, right? And social media, to be honest. Correct. Yes. It, the relationship is different, obviously different levels, right? You, We mm. can say the, that you have the intimate relationships, the inner circle relationships, and then the everybody else relationships where you're connected. Your people who read your books 
who open your emails, who listen to your podcasts, who follow you on social media, who stay there a long time, they do care. I have people who reach out to me and ask me certain questions about my life because they're just paying attention. And I think that's lovely as long as it's not a little weird. Right? <laughs> yeah, a little, a little stalky. But again, that, that comes down to how much you do share. Like, I mean, people can find a picture of my husband online, but we have different names. And it's like I do selfies because he doesn't want to be in my photos on Instagram or whatever. So <laughs> he has his private life. And I mean, put your lines in, don't you? And then you share within that. That's correct. Yes, there is definitely, there is the in, the intimate circle. Those are the hide the body folks, right? It's like, if I had to hide a body, those are the people I'm calling. There. There's a different level of information. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Than what I'm posting, than what I'm posting. But I have found, and I discovered this when I wrote my second book, I was open kimono in that book, as in very personal, I shared very personal information. Not super personal, but I was just- uh, Was that your divorce book? It was the successful single mom. Yes. So Mm. I wrote about that because I honestly thought, Joanna, no one's ever going to read this. No one cares. It was cathartic for me. It was, you understand, right? When you write, it's a, it's as much for yourself as it is for anyone who would read it. Mm. It's transformational. And then it was actually a fairly successful book and became a series. And so I thought, gosh, if I'd known anybody was ever going to read it, I would have never written so authentically and so openly. But then that was what connected people to me is when you share a bit of yourself, they like it, right? If they're following you, if they discover you and they like you, when people are reading your book, they're looking for clues about who the author is too. And I don't know about you, but I grew up in a time when authors were untouchable, unreachable. Yeah. Strange creatures that we could never be them. (laughs) Yes. It's the Loch Ness monster, right? It doesn't exist and you could never talk to them. And then lo and behold, um, Actually, you you can subscribe to their email list and you can watch their Instagram stories and subs- and read all of their books and learn about them, read articles about them. I mean, I, 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 Colleen Hoover, call me. We would be great friends, right? <laughs> like I read the New York <laughs> Times article on her. I'm fascinated when I've, by her and I've listened to some podcast interviews and I love the fact that she is just unapologetically who she is. And she unapologetically writes what she wants to write. And I think that's so wonderful. It's such such a great example for the rest of us. Yeah. And we should say Colleen Hoover, although she became super famous on TikTok, she was an indie for, I mean, she's hybrid now. She does all kinds of publishing, but she, I remember when she was original indie and, you know, and it can take years too. She's not brand new. She's been going for years. So, oh, and just, so on that, you do talk about staying true to your book and that like the avocado, the avocado goes off, but your book doesn't go off. So how how can we market backlist books more effectively as our career goes on? How can we still market those books? Well, they don't go bad. And so it's just the more books I write, the more I have to remember my backlist, which is one of the things that I do just to remember about a book is I have it in my calendar. So when it's the book's birthday, it'll come up and it'll say, you published this book on November 11th of 2014. And so I'll go and post about it. I have a pretty interesting production calendar that reminds me to do a quarterly promotion, like do a free book promotion or do whatever, right? There are so many different options. So each of my different books and book categories, so I have single mom books and business books and books for writers. And so I have to stay on top of those. And I do that with my very um, unimpressive spreadsheet. Anyone who would run a spreadsheet would be unimpressed with my my Excel skills because it's in Word, right? (laughs) They'd be horrified. But I'm a writer. I'm not a I'm not a math person. I'm not an Excel person, but I keep track of the dates. And so I have all the dates and I have reminders in my phone on my calendar that remind me, okay, the anniversary of this book is coming up or it's been three months, you need to market it. And so it's going off constantly with all the books I have. And I have to pick and choose which venues I'm choosing to promote the books on. The I think the most important and most interesting and most effective way to market a book is to release another book. Even as you must market your book is getting ready to be in the world officially, you must write a book is picking up sales because people are seeing that this new book is coming and that there's a book before it. And so they're checking it out and buying it. Thank you for that idea, because 
this is a total problem that starts to happen the more books you have because w- when you start writing you think I'll never forget about that that book and then <laughs> like 20 books later 40 books later I just ah. interviewed someone who got 200 books there is no way you're going to remember like what the hell happened and especially as, as decades go by too and I haven't done this and you're completely right you just have a book birthday for each of the books and then a reminder maybe two weeks before which is this is coming up what can you do about it so that's a great idea that I can't believe I haven't actually done that oh, well, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm so do it to give, I'm so <laughs> glad to give you an idea that's fantastic I also create which I sent to you I create a one sheet for every book that is my name and how to say it and my social media and my website and my bio. And then I write 10 questions that the host could ask me about the book if they don't have time to read it. So it seems like they've read the book for the podcast host. But then I also do a cheat sheet and I answer the questions in writing after the book has come out and I've moved on because I don't want to forget the answers to the book because I think nothing is more embarrassing than someone saying, well, what are the four cornerstones of a professionally published book? Or what does that stand for? And I'm like, I don't know. You tell me you read it more recently than I have. So I have all these cheat sheets that I've saved for my book. So that if someone wants to interview me about a book that I wrote two years ago or 10 years ago, I can pull out the one sheet and read the questions and the cheat sheet and read the answers. I don't have to read the whole book, but I can answer the questions intelligently. And of course, because I did write it, it will refresh my memory. I love that too. And this is great. This is behind the scenes info for people. But I have the same thing where people will like, oh, I want to interview you on like my book, How to Market a Book. It was a few years old now. Or my book on speaking, for example. I'm like, please, can you send questions beforehand? And then what I'll do is I'll obviously I will prepare and I'll answer those questions. But then I'll also I prefer audio only because I can have my vellum document up and I can <laughs> I can just right. navigate can to the chapter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I, but I think that you're so organized, you're brilliantly organized. I love that idea. Certainly doing the questions for the podcast host. I I have discovered over the years that I'm quite unusual. Maybe it's because this is a book show, right? But I read everything or at least I skim through everything and I try and ask questions that actually the host might not have even answered before because I want to challenge people and get different answers. So I think there's a combination of both, but a lot, as you say, many podcast hosts will not read the book and certainly most media pitches, they're not going to read your book. Mm. They don't have time. It is such an honor when someone says, I have read your book because Mm. I always get more money. I cannot get any more time. When I spend a minute, it's gone. It's gone forever. And I recognize that if I want to be on someone's podcast, I'm going to take up 30 minutes of their time, at least maybe an hour plus production plus preparation time. And if I can make that easier for them and in so doing easier for myself, then it's, then everybody wins. Yeah. A very, very good tips there. People listening, if you're going to pitch podcasts, these are very good tips. And I mean, even if you have a fiction book, you can still do these questions and things like that around themes and what did you really mean and character development. And in fact, some people do this now in the back of their fiction books. They'll do a sort of reading group list, things to discuss with your Mm -hmm. um, book group, for example. So yeah, that really good. I mean, it's too easy to think, oh, of course they're going to read my book because my book's amazing. (laughs) Right. Your book is amazing, but it takes an hour to two hours to six hours to read. And who are they going to bill that time to, right? How are they yeah. going, how are they going, right? I mean, honestly, like, how are they going to get that time back? They can't get the time back. So then the, that time then is worth something to them. How are they going to get that back? And I just think it's worth considering because hosts, some hosts do read the book. Some hosts read the book and then ask you to be on their show. And that's fine. Still being prepared, still having a one sheet a with a bio and a photo, making it very easy for someone to book themselves on your calendar or vice versa. That's just podcast preparation 101, in my opinion. But I've mm. also done a lot of interviews and I've figured out, I think, what makes it great for the host, makes their job easy. Yeah. So I really love your business mind and we've always connected over that. We've met in person and we've hung out at events and I think your ambition is fantastic and you're very open and honest about your business ambition and you've got your mastermind, you've got a course on building a million dollar book business and I I feel like authors... (sighs) 
many authors have ambition. <laughs> like we want to make loads of money. We want to get a book deal, whatever. But a lot of people hide it and they feel almost ashamed of their ambition. So how can we tap into that ambition in a really good way that helps us, but also not be disappointed when we don't get that TV deal? Oh, I love that question. Thank you for asking that question. And thank you for your kind words. I very much appreciate them, especially coming from you, who I admire very much. I think that there is some work that could be done. I don't like to should on people, right? I either say you must do something or I say you could do something, but I, I don't should on them. I think there could be some work done on their personal development. My belief is that your professional development and your success will never exceed your level of personal development. And I'm not the person that said that. I want to say Ed Zig Ziglar or Jim Rohn. I have spent a lot of time working on myself and expanding my self-belief, my self-confidence, and my belief in what's possible. I think we rarely reach our potential. I think we're capable of so much more than we give ourselves credit for. But I don't take myself too seriously. When I was talking about making a dance video for TikTok, I thought, boy, it would be hilarious. I would probably laugh until I hurt. <laughs> I'd probably fall <laughs> yeah. down. I'd probably fall down and actually hurt myself. But I don't take myself too seriously. And I don't let my success or learn or lessons, right? Because I think I win some and I learn some. I don't take myself or my success too seriously. And I don't let it define me. And I haven't let it change me to change me and who I am. So I think my ambition is constant because I don't really think I've gotten anywhere. I can look back and go, oh yeah, I've written some books and I've done some things and that's been cool, but I'm always facing forward, right? I'm always driving forward. And so I enjoy it. I'm having a book launch party because my friends are making me. <laughs> They're mm-hmm. like, you gotta have a book launch party. I'm like, okay, sure. We'll have cupcakes. We'll have tea. It'll be fine. But I think the more you work on yourself, the more y- your success will come <laughs> automatically because you're putting in the work and you're just staying in it and you're loving the process. And I think that's another piece of it is I absolutely hundred percent love what I do. And I wake up every morning, like, oh my gosh, I'm still doing this. I'm not a bricklayer. Right? I don't actually <laughs> yeah, work, I the feeling. I don't work. I don't work hard for a living. I feel like I'm getting away with something. And at some point someone's going to knock on my door and go, okay, now it's time to go to the office. Now you're going to have to go back to work. But so far they haven't, maybe because I keep, I've moved, right? <laughs> like I've, I've moved a few times. They're like, we don't have our current address. But I think it's it comes down to a combination of working on yourself, your personal development, not taking yourself too seriously, finding the thing that you love to do. So Because when you love to do it, like I'm, you and I are talking a little bit about the fact that I'm writing fiction and I don't have any designs on like, I'm going to be the number one writer. I'm going to sell this many books or whatever. I've never really done that. I just find that I'm having one heck of a time. I'm having so much fun writing fiction. It's such a blast. And so even if no one ever reads it or someone reads it and they're like, this is terrible. I had a good time. I wrote a story I liked. It's a, it's great. Yeah. And I think I love that. And I'm really interested to see what you do with that eventually, because I feel like one of the issues, I, I know a lot of nonfiction authors who try to write fiction and who do write fiction, but then are disappointed because it it's like starting again. I mean, like you're an incredibly successful nonfiction author, speaker, et cetera, and you're at the top of the ladder. And when you start with fiction, it's like you're at the bottom of another ladder. Um, but as so you say, if you yeah, yeah, like you're really, <laughs> you're really starting oh, again. Bottom. And that can be quite humbling, I guess. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, for sure. Well, but it's like, I don't know. I mean, at some point I just kind of throw up my hands and go, okay, well, what's the worst that could happen? And I'm in it. I'm in that. I keep hearing you can't edit a blank page. So I just keep writing and then going back and reading and I'm like, oh, the eye color's wrong. I need a legend or whatever, right? Where you make a list of the characters. Cause like in one <laughs> yeah. chapter, I give them one name. And then the next chapter, I give them a different name. I don't know what's wrong. Maybe it's because I'm not writing it all in the same day. I sleep and I eat and I forget, but I'm just having a good time. And I think maybe I've been somewhat successful because I don't take it so seriously. I'm not holding on so tight to it. Yeah. I don't. I don't, you know, I, t- I think my advice to someone in, in whether they're writing or they're growing a business or they're just living life is to take the criticism and the encouragement or the attaboys with the same energy. It's like, you did great and you did terrible are the same. 
Because if you're not in my intimate list, right? If you're not going to help me hide a body, then I, I don't know that you can give me your opinion with the same weight. Yeah, that's good. But I know a lot of people struggle with opinions <laughs> or, I know. From, from, from other people. But I'm, I did want to ask you one more question before we finish, which is sure. about longevity. Because like you've said, you've been doing this at what, 18 years. And I mean, there are people who come and go and you and I have seen those people over the years and there are people who keep putting books out and who like I love the writing fiction for fun and not taking it seriously because in someone with your business that seems yeah it seems like a fun thing for no reason and it might not grow to a business and hey it doesn't matter so is that one of your tips for longevity which is you have to keep changing it up or you're going to be bored and you'll go do something else yes so my number one thing is I have to own it it cannot own me I own my empire my empire does not own me and so I have done a lot of things that I no longer do anymore because I lost interest in them I used to do a lot of executive and business coaching with executives and business owners and entrepreneurs. And there was a time when I thought, oh gosh, I'm just going to do this forever. And then one day I woke up and I was like, you know what? I don't want to do that. Mm. <laughs> I want to do something. I want to do something in- interesting to me now that's new because I like the new thing. I like learning the new thing and mastering the, the new thing and moving on. And I also like multiple income streams so that I'm never tied to something. If something goes away, I've got other things. And so I've kept it interesting for me. So you're right. As I've gotten bored with something, I, I let go of it. If I can't set it and forget it, I just forget it. it (laughs) That's great. I love that. And I mean, that's the thing we're talking now because I still find this show interesting enough. I can still talk to you and talk to people that I find interesting enough. Like I have thought about giving up this show a number of times and it's because I was getting bored. But once I kind of just shifted to look, I'm going to interview people I'm interested in, books that I'm interested in, topics I'm interested in, and ask the questions that I think are interesting. (laughs) Then it was like, oh, it's sustainable. It's sustainable for the long term. And the moment it gets boring, then yeah, this show will will disappear. But the moment I still love it. (laughs) Yes. Yes. It, It has to be something that you are waking up for. I wake up before my alarm. My alarm goes off with a four in it every day. And I wake up before my alarm. And I'm so excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's another day. I get to do these cool things that I'm going to do. I have on my list today. Yeah. Fantastic. So where can people find you and your books and your courses and everything you do online? I think my website is probably the best place for people to go. Just honorayquarter.com. And I'm on the socials. I'm not hard to find. I have a unique name. (laughs) You do. And all the links will be in the show notes. So thanks for your time, Honore. That was great. Oh, so great to talk to you, Joanna. Let's not let another eight years go by. (laughs) So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Honoré and that it gave you some ideas for your book marketing. Now, next week, I'm talking about co-writing in a shared universe and also changing indie business models with Martha Carr, who many of you will know from the 20 Books to 50K community. And it's definitely an interesting chat. So I'll also be back home this week and busily fulfilling my Kickstarter. In the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.